Hello, I'm Andrew Richards from the IT Service, and welcome to your 15-minute guide to the General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR. This guide is designed to give you a really quick overview of what's in the GDPR and some of the key things that you'll need to do to comply with this important new legislation. For more detailed information, take a look at our other videos about GDPR or get in touch via our website at www.theitservice.co.uk. The GDPR is a new piece of legislation that came in in May 2018. It's a European law and it governs the way that organisations must work with your, my, all our personal data. To answer the first obvious question, yes, it will affect Britain post-Brexit, because it's already been written more or less lock, stock and barrel into UK law as the Data Protection Act of 2018. The GDPR is made up of 99 articles and 173 recitals, totalling over half a million words. So in this video, I'll be giving you a really condensed guide. If you want more information, information please don't hesitate to get in touch with us and we'll be happy to help you further. We've run training courses and seminars for companies large and small, everyone from British Museum through to Thames Valley Police and Crime Commissioner's Office, so we'll be very happy to help. In this guide, we cover four key areas of the GDPR. One, the core principles of the GDPR. Two, the concept of having a lawful basis for processing, including issues around consent and legitimate interests. Three, the documentation that you'll need to keep in order to comply with GDPR's insistence that you demonstrate that you've complied with the regulation. And four, the rights that people have under the GDPR. Let's start with those principles. At the heart of the GDPR lie the six core principles in Article 5. They say that, one, your processing of personal data has to be lawful, fair and transparent. Now we'll come back to lawful in a minute, but in a nutshell the concept of fair and transparent means that you shouldn't shock people by doing dodgy things with their data that they wouldn't be expecting you to do, and furthermore that people should know what's happening to their data. Now, we ought to pause, I guess, for a moment to define just what we mean by personal data. GDPR defines personal data as any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person. So that's names and addresses, email addresses, bank details, medical details, spending habits, video and audio recordings, political allegiances, and yes, the fact that you spend your entire salary on rescuing pet rabbits. All of those things count as personal data for GDPR. The second principle says that the collection of personal data should be for specified and legitimate purposes. In other words, tell people what you're collecting data for and then do just that. If you're saying, can we have your email so that we can send you a receipt, then sending me the receipt is your specified purpose, not adding me to your mailing list of forever. If I sign up to attend an event, you can send me the information about that event, but not your life insurance policy product, unless you specify that my data is being used for marketing purposes. Principle 3 says that the data you collect should be adequate, relevant and limited to what's necessary. So you've got a purpose for collecting data, right? Now you have to collect all that you need, but only what you need in order to fulfill that purpose. Don't ask for my gender if you don't need it. Don't ask for my favourite newspaper unless you really can't do without that information. If you start asking me for my date of birth, my mother's maiden name and my bank details, I'll know you're trying to scam me, or that you're really stupid. And that incidentally also applies to you. If you need to send me, for example, my bumper pack of luxury bath products, but you forget to ask for my address. The data has to be adequate for its purposes, as well as limited to what's necessary. The fourth principle says that the data you collect should be accurate and, where necessary, kept up to date. Now, that makes pure business sense, of course. If it's not up to date, why are you holding the data? If you've got a list of customers and, for example, their email addresses are incorrect, well, good luck in sending your invoice to them. If you're going to send me that batch of luxurious bath bubble products, then you'd better have my home address right. 
But if you're only keeping my details because the law requires that you archive transaction data for seven years for accounting purposes, well, you've no need to email me each month to check that that archived data is up to date. The fifth principle says that the data you hold should be kept in a manner which permits identification of the data subject only for as long as is necessary. In other words, don't hold data for longer than you need it. Let's take an example. If I apply for a job with you, your HR team can hold my data maybe for six months in case I bring a lawsuit for discrimination because I didn't get the job. Now maybe after that, you'll want to know whether your applicants were mostly male or female so that you can monitor whether you're showing signs of bias in your recruitment process. But for that purpose, you don't need to keep my personal details for that. You don't need to know that a specific candidate was male, female, of this ethnicity or that religion. You can anonymize that data and just keep the statistics. The final principle states that the personal data you hold should be processed in a way which guarantees its security. There's an acronym here. You need to ensure the data's CIA. C is for confidentiality. You need to make sure that only people who are authorized can get access to your data. I is for integrity. You need to make sure that only authorized people can change your data and that changes are logged if necessary. And A is for availability. In other words, if your system goes down, you better have a way of bringing it up again. Now, I can't emphasize enough, this is not, I repeat, not a matter for IT. If you have work emails on your phone, it's you that needs to guard your phone with your life. If you're the one who put that file on the memory stick, you'd better be the one who takes it off again when you're done and chains that memory stick to your earlobe so you don't leave it somewhere. Now, let me ask you a question. Have you ever sent an email to the wrong person in error? Come on, put your hands up. Yes, you at the back as well. If you haven't got your hands up, I don't believe you. So, here's a sobering story for all of us. In 2016, one organization was fined £150,000 because one member of staff sent an email to one wrong person in error. £150,000! Are you scared? You should be. The thing is, security comes down not just to IT systems, but to staff. It's the staff who are the weak point in any security system. If you watch the video through to the end, I'll tell you about the organization and why it was fined so much money. It really is a serious lesson to all of us. Now, remember that first principle. It said that your processing has to be lawful, fair and transparent. So in this part of the video, we're going to revisit this and come back to the idea that your processing has to be lawful. It has to have what's called a lawful basis. These lawful bases are listed in Article 6 of the GDPR. Now, this does not mean that you have to have consent to process anyone's data. If you've read that, if you've heard that, I guarantee what you've read or heard was wrong. There are six ways in which processing can be lawful. Consent is just one. But if you are planning on using consent as your lawful basis, well, you'd better do it right. So, consent is the first lawful basis option. In essence, you can process my data if I consent to you doing so, as long as you gather my consent properly and have evidence of that. In a nutshell, consent needs to be given by a clear, affirmative action, which indicates the data subjects freely given, specific, informed and unambiguous consent to your processing. It can't be inferred from silence or a pre-ticked box because that's not an action. You can't get consent from someone over whom you have significant power, such as an employee, because that imbalance of power would mean that the consent is not reckoned to be freely given. And you can't get consent for such processing as we deem necessary or on behalf of carefully selected third parties, because that's just meaningless. Which third parties? What are they doing with my data? And how did you select them? I'm guessing it was based on the size of their wallet. If I see that phrase in your privacy notice on your website, I'll be personally coming around to hit you over the head with a printed copy of the GDPR. One last thing. 
According to GDPR, it must be as easy to withdraw consent as it is to give it. And now all those caveats mean that consent may not be a very attractive option for your lawful basis, but that's okay, because remember, you've got five other options. The second lawful basis is that the processing is necessary for the performance of a contract or to enter steps uh, to take steps rather to enter into a contract at the request of the subject. So, if I bought something and now you need to send me a bill, worry not, that's fine by me. I love getting bills and you don't need my consent. The third lawful basis allows you to process personal data if the processing is necessary for you to comply with a legal obligation. So to give a classic example, when you're sharing your employee data with HMRC, you can sleep sound at night. You don't need the employee's consent for your processing because your lawful basis is that to comply with tax law, you've got to share data with them. So there's three lawful bases that we've covered so far. Here's the fourth. If in a minute I turn blue, and I pass out while eating a bag of peanuts, and you know that I'm allergic to peanuts, when the paramedics arrive, you can tell them, please do. Don't tell them you can't because GDPR says you can't. The fourth lawful basis is that the processing is necessary to protect the vital interest of the subject. Fifth lawful basis applies if you're subject to the Freedom of Information Act. It says that the processing is lawful if it's necessary in the public interest or because of your official authority. How does this fit in with the Freedom of Information Act? Well, if you're subject to FOI, then you're also deemed an official authority for the purposes of GDPR. So you can process data in the performance of your duties on that lawful basis. Finally, there's the sixth lawful basis, which is that you can process personal data if the processing is necessary in the pursuance of your legitimate interests, as long as your interests are outweighed by the rights and freedoms of the subject. So, you can use this as your lawful basis if you can pass three tests, the legitimate interest assessment. One, you have to have a genuine legitimate interest in processing my data, which you must document. Two, you must process my data only if it's necessary and proportionate for you to pursue those interests. And three, you can do so if my rights as the subject are not likely to outweigh yours as the controller. So this may very well be the lawful basis that you'll want to use when our interests are shared and we're all on the same side. Or where you've got a real reason to be using my data, which you'd have no trouble defending if it came to it even if I might, as the subject, not like it. For example, if I decide not to pay your bill, you'd have no problem justifying sending my details to a debt collection agency, even though I might not like having someone large turn up at my door and asking politely for the £5,000 I owe you, so you could use legitimate interest as your lawful basis. You're pursuing your interest of getting your bill paid. So there we go. That's your rundown of the six options for processing data lawfully. I know that they're sometimes confusing and it's not always clear which one you should use. And I know I'm going through them quite fast. But if you want more information, just get in touch via the website at www.theitservice.co.uk. Now, there's one other thing I need to say about all of this. The GDPR says that if you're a data controller, that is, if it's you that's making decisions about what to data to collect and what you're going to do with it, you don't just have to comply with the GDPR, you have to prove that you're complying. And that means you've got to keep records. So that's where we're going next. Coming up later in this video, we're going to take a look at what rights people have under the GDPR, and I'll tell you that story of the large fine for sending a mistaken email. But before we get to that, I want to go through some of the key documentation you need to have in place to comply with the GDPR. Firstly, if you've decided to use consent as your lawful basis, then you need to keep records of who's consented, and when, and what they've consented to. 
Conversely, if you're using legitimate interests, you'll need to document that three-part legitimate interest assessment we talked about, so that you can show what your interest is, why the processing is legitimate and proportionate, and why it doesn't override the subject's rights and freedoms. Beyond that, you'll need to document what you're doing with data more generally. Now, the requirements for this are in Article 30 of the GDPR, so they're often known as Article 30 records of processing activities. There's quite a lot to record here, and different things, depending on whether you're controlling the data or you're just processing it on behalf of somebody else. So for more information about what's required, I can't recommend highly enough a brilliant blog post here. There we go. So just follow that link, and yes, of course, it's a bit of shameless pluggery because we wrote the article. Whenever you're about to begin a new process involving data, especially if that process involves new technologies or there's likely to be a special level of risk to subjects because, let's say, you're processing special category data, sensitive data, or you're doing something like profiling, you need to assess the impact of that data processing. How do you do that? By conducting a Data Protection Impact Assessment, or DPIA. In this, you'll assess what data you're processing whose data it is, and why your processing is proportionate. But above all, you're assessing where the risks are likely to be, and how you can mitigate them. And you need to document the output of this assessment. So your DPIA is the next piece of documentation that you need to keep in order to prove that you're complying with the GDPR. Now, there's all sorts of great software available on the web to help you do this for every budget. But to be honest, if you want a simple tool to help you assi assess whether you need to do a DPIA and also to help you conduct a basic one, then we've created a great, just simple Excel template that will help you with that. Just click the link below and we'll take you to a page where you can download this Excel template for free. So, you've got your records of consent, you've got your legitimate interest assessments, and you've got your Article 30 records. You've got your DPIAs that we are, we've just conducted. What else do you have to do? We've talked about you being a controller, where you make decisions about the data, or a processor, where you're doing the processing on behalf of someone else. If you're the controller and you decide to use a processor to help with the processing, then you can't just phone them up and say, hey, do you fancy playing around with our data? You have to have a written contract in place with each processor that you use. And there are specific requirements as to what should go into that contract. The requirements are listed in Article 28 of the GDPR, and that goes through the obligations of processors. But of course, you'll also want to talk to your legal advisors to make sure that you're covered and that you're not being left vulnerable by the contract you create. Talking of being vulnerable, I guess we need to think about when everything goes wrong. Maybe you'll be hacked. Maybe your one database backup will be corrupted. Maybe a rogue employee on the last day of their employment with you will take out their frustrations on you and the company by exporting a load of your data and taking it with them to share with a rival organisation, or worse yet, with their Twitter account. We're talking here, of course, about you having some form of data breach. Every breach you suffer, whether catastrophic or trivial, has to be logged. And so that breach log is another piece of documentation that you need to have. You need to record what happened, whose data was breached, what the likely impacts of the breach may be, and what you're doing about it. And unless you can reasonably assess that there's not likely to be a risk to your data subjects, you're going to need to report this breach to the Information Commissioner, or if you're not in the UK, your country's supervisory body. And you're going to need to do this within 72 hours if feasible. It may even be, if there's likely to be a high risk to the subjects, that you need to report the breach directly to them. So you'd better get the facts straight, which is why you need to maintain your breach log. You need to tell people what you're doing with the data you collect them. That's the next thing. So that's why you have a privacy notice, detailing what you're doing, where you share the information, why you're collecting it, what your lawful basis is, and so on. In other words, you need to have a privacy notice to keep people informed. So, to recap, at the very least, the documentation you'll need is records of consent, legitimate interest assessments, Article 30 records of processing activities, data protection impact assessments, 
contracts with your processors or joint controllers, breach logs, and privacy notices. Now, there's so much I've not told you yet. There are so many things that we're just not going to have time to cover, I'm afraid. We haven't even mentioned, for example, the role of data protection officers or international data transfers. But if you want to know more, then please just come talk to us. Come visit the website www.theitservice.co.uk and we'll be happy to help. I did say that I talked to you about your rights as a data subject. So we'll finish with that and of course the story of how that organisation was fined 150,000 quid for one email that went astray. Now, if you're a data subject, and if you're a fellow human being, I can pretty much guarantee that you are, you've got new rights. You should know them, just as you should know all your rights. And if you're not sure that you are what the GDPR terms a natural living person, then well, you need to understand them how they affect and how they affect your company. So, in total, the GDPR offers eight rights to people. Here we go then with our rundown of these rights. In at number eight, there's a right you have under the old Data Protection Act, the right not to be subject to automated decision making. So anyone who's been turned down for a loan or job because the computer says no, you've got the right to have a human intervene. Just hope you get a friendly human. At number seven, you've got the right to object. Not just to anything, mind you, but where the processing was based on legitimate interests or the public interest or public authority lawful basis. There's good news here, you can always object to direct marketing. In for the first time at number six, we have a brand new entry, the right to data portability. This is the right to get your data back from the data controller, as long as you provide it on the lawful basis of necessary for a contract or consent. Ideally, the controller should send it direct to another controller, allowing you, for example, to change service providers. Just be aware that this only applies to data that's processed automatically. One place above at number five, you've got a right of restriction. So if the accuracy of your data is in dispute, or there's a debate about whether you've got the right to object, or perhaps you've got the right to have the data erased but you don't want to, you can have the data as restricted as a Victorian in a corset. What this means is that the controller can't do anything but store it. It can't be used or shared until the restriction is lifted. And when they lift the restriction, they have to tell you that they've done so. At number four, we've got our highest new entry. This is the right of erasure, sometimes known as the right to be forgotten. If your data is no longer necessary for the purpose for which it was collected, or if you've objected to the processing and there's no overriding grounds that the controller can rely on, you've got the right to have it erased. If your data was unlawfully processed, you've got the right to have it erased. And, well, there are other cases too, but you'll have to come on one of our courses or do some more reading to learn about those. Time for the top three now. In at number three, we've got the alliterative allure of the right to rectification. So if your data's wrong, you can have it put right. And if your data's incomplete, you can add to it to make it complete. Buying for top spot, but holding steady at number two. We're looking at the famous right of access. Yes, all those of you wanting to make a subject access request, known and loved by all as a SAR, this is the right for you. You can ask any organisation, what have you got on me? And if you're an organisation, you'll need to respond now in just a month, not the 40 days you've had before. Better yet, this is a right you can have for free. The days of charging for a SAR are gone. And at number one, at the top of this week's charts, it's still sitting proud, the right to be informed. When you get someone's data, you've got to tell them what you're doing with it and why. There's other things too. Just take a look at articles 13 and 14. Remember, this right applies even if you've got someone's data from a third party, rather than from the data subject direct. So there we have it. Those are your data subject rights under the GDPR. If you've got questions or want more, please come visit us at
the IT team at UK, see how you can get in touch with us and ask us to help. I'm just about done now, but I did promise you that story of the organisation which was hit with the big fine. As I said, the year in question was 2016. The organisation was David Powers Police. There was an employee who sent an email. The email was supposed to be an internal email, but accidentally it was sent externally. How would that happen? The employee was using Outlook, and Outlook did its usual thing of prompting you for recently used email addresses. The employee chose the wrong one. So, the internal email was sent to a member of the public. What did the email contain? A list of known sex offenders, with enough information to contact them. That's why it mattered. That's why they were fined £150,000. But you know, not even that was the real price. The real price, of course, was the reputational damage, all the press coverage, and the fact that you can still read about it on the ICO website. So there we go. You can see why the breach was taken so seriously. And remembering that a minute ago you all put your hand up and said that you've sent an email to the wrong person, you can see why I said most data breaches are caused by an organization's employees and why you have to take data seriously. OK, that's it from me. I really hope this information was useful. If so, please leave us a comment, or share the video, or better yet, send us loads of money. If in fact, if you send us enough money, we'll come and do a course for you. Thanks very much for watching. Don't forget, come visit us at www.theitservice.co.uk.